right. So next up we have uh, David Lunderkort, um, the as I see in his uh, slide notes here, founder of Obvious, which is an incredible tool, but with an incredible, uh, incredibly difficult uh, grammar uh, <laughs> rule set. Uh, anyway, uh, he'll be talking about uh, Razor, uh, a provisioning tool, and I'll give to him to explain what it does exactly. Thanks, Walter. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, as, yeah, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm David. I'm, I'm Ryan from Visioning Software. Um, <laughs> and I've been with Puppet Lab for, yeah, since May of last year, so about nine months now. Um, but uh, even though I'm pretty new to Puppet Labs, I've been in the Puppet community for much longer. I ran across Puppet pretty early on, in late 2005 or so. And, Bunch of stuff on it, pushed it into Fedora, and uh, yeah, I've been around it one one way or another for a long time. And yeah, one of the things that came out of my exposure to config management with Puppet, because I'm not a sysadmin by background, I'm a developer. Um, one of the things came out of it, out of it was obvious, and if you modify your config files still with set grep and all, stop doing that right now and um, check out obvious. But this talk isn't about obvious, it's about Razor, it's about provisioning. Provisioning is one of these words that mean a lot of things to a lot of people, kind of like configuration or systems management. Um, for purposes of this talk, what I mean when I talk about um, configuration uh, and about provisioning is you know, this sort of situation. Um, you have a lot of machines and you need to get them to do something useful. Hopefully your machines are sitting in the back backyards. Uh, hopefully somebody's like racked them and cabled them up and they're ready to go. Um, but traditionally, Puppet has had kind of a first mile problem when it comes to, to getting going. Uh, because Puppet really only starts after you have enough stuff on your machines that you can run an agent on there. And yeah, Razor is a tool to kind of close that, that first first mile gap. Um, it's of course not the only tool to do that. Yeah, there's a ton of, uh, of tools out there to help you with pixie provisioning. There's a ton of open source tools that do it. Um, each of the big management packages has some provisioning functionality. And there's of course, I'm sure everybody in here has their favorite Perl script, you know, the thousand line script that does everything anybody might ever want to do with pixie provisioning. But if you look at them, they all yeah, they kind of fall into two piles. One of them, they do too little, and the other one, they do too much. The tools that do too little are the ones that you know, just stop once they've installed all the packages, kind of, that end when you have a kickstart file. You have to run through a kickstart file during your, your install. Because in, you know, you're not just installing for the hell of it, at some point you need to manage that, um, that machine too. And so the other pile, the tools that do too much, they re realize that that's a problem and you need to do something to get more fine grained management than just plonking packages down and they throw all this contact management functionality. But that's of course the wrong place for contact management functionality because your provisioning tools only involved at the very first time you build your machine, but you need contact management on an ongoing basis. So Razor tries to be the Goldilocks of provisioning tools. Yeah. Don't do too little, don't do too much, do, do just the right amount. And the way it does it is that it makes it very easy to, once a system has been built, to hand it off to a contact management system to, for further maintenance. So the philosophy behind Razor is that you, know, you just install the bare minimum of whatever operating system you're installing, and then enroll it with you know, Puppet or Chef or some other contact management tool. Um, and then do the actual personalization of the, the system with that. And since there's so many variations of you know, provisioning tools out there to get a better idea, I made up a little user survey. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk to any users, so I just made up the answers too. Um, <coughs> this is, yeah, and so we've done a lot of software engineering research with that. Um, how that happens. Um, but to, um, to give a little prehistory about what, you know, why Razor came about, or how it came about, and why it does what it does. Um, it was started by two guys at EMC, they're now at VMware, um, Nick Weaver and Tom McSweeney. Um, they, they launched it in the spring of 2012 at EMC World, and then in the fall of that year at PuppetCon, they announced that they would move maintenance of Razor over to Puppet Labs, uh, because it's a really good fit with Puppet, 
um, but also because they felt they didn't have the time and resources to, to really push it forward. And what's happened since then is that uh, over the last six months or so, you know, we in the early summer we took a look at what we, you know, where the code base was, the industry code base, um, and kind of lessons learned from people using it. Um, one of the lessons was that it was really hard to get the initial code base installed and going, um, and of course to, to maintain it. Um, and so we decided to rewrite the whole thing. And my talk is about the rewrite. Um, at this point, the initial code base is you know, legacy. If you have an installation for that, um, great, but you know, nobody should be installing that code base. Uh, use the, the rewritten code base. So one of the things that makes Razor unique is that it <coughs> yeah, that it deviates from you know, kind of the, the general approach of, of these pixel provisioning tools that try to make you look, look at your machines as pets. You know, these things that you know intimately well and you have a personal relation to them and you really care about them. Right? When somebody comes, hey, build me a web server, database server, whatnot. Um, you go down the data center and look at your 500 most favorite, most beloved servers and pick the one that yeah, is going to, to, do, to do what you need to do and go back to the office. Enter the MAC address into your provisioning tool and then hopefully you've got a machine at some point. Um, so Razor kind of taking inspiration from how people use cloud and trying to move that a little bit into, into the bare metal world or in the pixel provisioning world once once you look at your machines more like cattle as things that are largely interchangeable, they have different characteristics, but you know, within each group they're pretty much the same. And just like with cattle you have you know, dairy you know, dairy cattle and cows that you raise for uh, for meat and yeah, maybe for breeding or for showing off at some show, but yeah, within that, that group, within each group, yeah, all the milk cows are pretty much interchangeable. Um, and the way Razor does that is that when a system first, yeah, when Razor first encounters a system, it puts it into what in Razor lingo is called a microkernel. It's really just a small Linux image that you know, puts on on that machine, runs Factor, and sends the facts back to to the Razor server. And because of that, your Razor server is kind of a, you know, has an inventory of the hardware that you have. Um, and then later on, um, Razor decides what should go on there uh, based on policy that you've set up. And so in your policy, you talk about what should happen with machines that have this much RAM and you know, these many cores and whatnot. Um, and you know, based on these poli policy and rules, Razor then decides, oh, you know, this should get RHEL, or this is a node that should get ESX installed. As I said, the, the rewrite, we changed a few things around. Um, one of the things is you know, we use Postgres now as the database, um, just because Postgres is awesome. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the database with Razor is not, not a huge concern. We literally store in tens of kilobytes of data for each node, so you can do the math, you know, how many nodes you would have to have before the database gets a respectable size. Um, we also use Sinatra. The, the server is written in Ruby, and we use a Ruby web framework called Sinatra. And if you haven't encountered Sinatra, you can think of Sinatra as Rails after a very, very serious dive. It's, uh, it's a really nice framework to write a web, web service. And the one thing that's probably a little unusual, I mean, so far that's a pretty standard web stack, um, we use Talkbox, which is kind of a, um, a plugin to JBoss that turns JBoss into a Ruby app server. I don't know how many of you have deployed Ruby apps and you know, before you know it, you have a simple application consists of like 10 demons, a few web workers and some background workers and something that reads email. It's a nightmare to manage, right? Because now you get to babysit 10 different things and monitor them and all that. Um, the nice thing about Talkbox is that it lets me as a developer do all these things, but it does it in one process. So as an admin, it's just watching this one process instead of this myriad of little things. Right, so the, the one thing that's missing from here, since I've been talking about Pixie provisioning so much, is you know, a little bit that you need for Pixie provisioning. What about DHCP, what about TFTP? And you know, there, Razor also deviates from a lot of the, the Pixie provisioning tools that kind of naturally branch into managing all that for you. Razor does not do that. We don't, you know, we don't really care what you use for the DHCP or TFTP, DNS mask, well, don't use DNS mask. Um, DHCPD, you know, what have you. 
um, all, we, all we need you to do is put two files onto your TFTP server and then set the machines and execute the, the usual thing. Um, but once you've put those two files on there, one of them is the IPixy firmware and the other one is a little script for IPixy that basically tells nodes once they come up, go and talk to this other server over here, the Razor server. And the, the genius of IPixy is that it lets you, it, it gets you out of the TFTP malaise of where you can't really do anything and lets you do all the booting via HTTP. And you know, now we can write the web server that has interesting behavior and does useful things um, just to boot machines. And so once you've got you know, those two files set down, you don't ever have to touch them, touch them again. Everything happens on the server. And uh, um, in terms of topology, Razor has really two APIs. One is a public API that you, you, know, you can think of that as the management API. That's what you use to tell the server what the policy and rules and whatnot are. And then there's on the other side, there's, there's a kind of private API that nodes use to talk to to the server while they're getting installed or while they're moving. Um, and that private API really only comes into play for you if you decide to write your own custom installer to do useful things because then you need to know how to get files from the server, you know, how to tell the server to log something or yeah, things like that. Um, the, yeah, the thing is that the public API, we have proper authentication around that we use basic HTTP authentication and use a library called Shiro, Shiro or Shiro underneath um, that makes it really easy to plug it into LDAP or you know, a bunch of other things. Um, so the public API is, is pretty well secured. The private API, just by its nature, you can't really secure because there, you know, when a node comes up and says, hey, I'm a machine that looks like this, we just have to believe it. There's no. So yeah, on the back end, you have to secure that, that network by physical means, like this, make it its own VLAN or just completely segregated from the rest of the ne network. But I think for people who do pixel provisioning, that's not good. How many of you actually do have to manage um, physical machines, pixel provisioning? Well, <laughs> yeah, when I started doing this, I would have never thought that there's you know, that many hands because everybody's talking about cloud. But I mean, it's still a real problem um, to, to do provisioning. Huh? Yes, that too. Yeah, yeah. I'll talk about that at the very end a little bit. Um, okay, and so the, the public API is kind of a fairly garden variety REST API. The, the one wrinkle is because it's really icky usually to modify things over, over REST and it gets really awkward. Um, to change things, we have <laughs> commands. So you, yeah, it's, yeah. you issue a command to create a policy or modify a policy instead of doing weird gymnastics with you know, representations of REST objects. Um, but the, the objects you, you need on your server are you know, kind of the ones that are on here. Policy is the most important thing that ties everything else together. Um, you need a repository or multiple repositories. That's the bits that you eventually want to install on a machine. You can either just point the Razor server at an existing repository like the YAM repo that you have sitting somewhere or at get repo. Or you can hand it a, an ISO and import it on the Razor server itself. So what people usually do for like Windows and ESX installation, they just import an ISO into the server. Um, broker is kind of Razor's lingo for the thing that does the handoff to the content management system at the end. So there's a puppet broker, there's a puppet enterprise broker, somebody in the community wrote chef broker. Um, we don't ship that, but somebody in the community actually wrote a broker that just sends a signal on an AMP message bus for the internal in infrastructure. So you can, you know, with a setup, you can do much more than just hand up to a content management system. Um, and I mean, broker, at the end of the day, it's a fancy word for a shell script. It's really, <laughs> really, really not much more. Um, tags are, you know, tags are named rules, essentially. Um, the way Razor works is that when a node comes in, Razor goes through all the tags it has and the, the rules that are associated with them and checks whether those rules match that node, whether yeah, your rule might say that it must have more than, than eight cores and 16 gigs of RAM, and then you tag it as a medium big machine. And all the same policy also carries tags, and once the tags for policy and the tags on the node match, the policy matches and gets applied to the node. 
um, and tasks at the end. That those are the actual things that do the installation, the you know, your Kickstart scripts and all that. Um, we actually for tasks went through a bunch of naming uh, gymnastics because you know, we initially called it installers, but we want to do these things more than just installation. So that, yeah, eventually we settled on, on tasks after a few detours. Um, <laughs> And to yeah, to write an installer or to write a task is, is actually once you have the yeah. the installation automated. So once you have a quick start script and maybe a post post install shell script together, getting that onto your Razor server is a matter of writing five or six lines of okay. metadata of what these files are. <laughs> Out of the box, we have uh, installers for these things on the right. So we have an installer for ESXi. That was one of the initial use cases that Nick and Tom had for Razor. They wanted to deploy ESXi. Um, and that's a real joy we haven't done that. Um, they wanted to deploy that automatically. Um, we also have installers, of course, for the various Linux flavors, RHEL, CentOS, Debian, Bob2. And then the thing I'm really excited about, which I didn't think we would get not that quickly is we also have a Windows 8 installer now, which is, I don't know how, how many of you install Windows on a regular basis, it's, yeah, it's fun. Um, but yeah, we have, yeah, and by all accounts, I haven't tried it, but by all accounts it actually works. Um, and so you can use Razor to provision yeah, pretty much all the offices you usually encounter in the innocent. Um, the installer itself is, is kind of a linear process. Um, you can say, yeah, the first time we boot with this installer, you do this, and that's usually you download some kernel in it RD that is actually the installer. And then the second time we boot, we do something else, and the third time, and so on. Um, until eventually you're done installing, and the thing is just you know, set to boot locally. From, from then on, you have you know, the machine in, in production, and yeah, it, it just boots locally. You could, for example, yeah, write your own installer that is the very first step does some configuration of a RAID card, right? Boot into some special image that lets you modify RAID config with whatever tools you use. Um, and then after that, boot into the, the real operating system as well. Really pretty easy thing to, to change. Okay. So everything is about nodes in um, in Razor, right? Those are the machines that we really do all this for. And why we do that? Because we need to put something on these machines. Um, and from Razor's point of view, a node largely consists of those four things. We have you know, a little bit of information about the hardware that iPixie sends us, MAC addresses, serial, I think. You don't get very much information out of iPixie just because you know, these firmers are, are really restricted in what they can tell you. Um, we have facts, which is right now a standard run of, of factor, if you, you know, which includes block devices and how much memory and cores and stuff like that. Um, then a fairly recent and really interesting addition is metadata. Um, you can you know, associate just a bunch of key value pairs um, with a node. And what makes this really interesting is you can do that both through the API, so you can make a call and set some metadata key. Um, but you can also do that from the installer, like the installer can call back, or you can of course read those in the installer and you know, make decisions based on certain metadata tags. So if you're totally crazy, you could push your, you know, whatever partitioning you want to have on your machine into metadata on your node, and then the installer can pull it out and you know, lay down your, your custom partitioning scheme. Um, and then yeah, the last thing is state. Um, which tells you whether the machine is installed. And that's right now the only thing that will add more flags there um, about what the node is doing. And those four things are all accessible when you write rules. So you know, the, the decisions about what gets provisioned, you can base them off all these, these pieces of data, which gives you, you know, a good amount of flexibility. Uh, another recent addition that's not on the slide is that uh, we also added IPMI support. So now you can use Razor to both enforce power state, you know, say this thing should be off and keep it off and check that it's off uh, every so often. You can reboot it and you, know, you can turn machines on or off, on and off. Uh, 
Um, right now, it's, you know, it's kind of simple. Basically, we support as much IPMI as, as IPMI tool does, but we want to add you know, support for other uh, remote power management. And so just a few examples of um, what Razor can do for you. Um, of course, you can you know, build machines with it and add to Puppet or some kind of other config management systems like Chef. Um, your initial use case of you know, building nodes and uh, setting them up with vCenter, um, you can, yeah, there's actually Puppet modules that help you do that. Um, but you know, Razor is well integrated with that. Um, one of the things I find really cool is you can use it to provision OpenStack. Um, because at the end of the day, you'll just you, know, you, you use Razor to lay down a basic operating system, get the Puppet agent going on that machine, and then you use the OpenStack Puppet modules to you know, actually turn your your machine into a Nova compute node or you know, Swift storage or what have you. Um, and then you know, something that we're you know, taking kind of baby steps towards, but I think that's what you know, where Razor will go in the longer term is something that manages the life cycle of your machines. One of the really important <coughs> differences between kind of Puppet's notion of what a node is and Razor's notion of what a node is, is that you know, Puppet thinks of a node as, as something that lives as long as the operating system is on there. If you take a machine and reinstall it, you know, Puppet will think, oh, that's a brand new node that I've never seen before. And, yeah. um, whereas Razor really follows the machine, yeah, the, the hardware itself. It's not confused by reinstalling things. It does not. Um, and so you can, yeah, you can use Razor to to build complex life cycles. But like one of the things that you know, people seem to do quite a bit is when you decommission a box, do a secure wipe before you um, install something else in there. Um, and that you can actually trigger just by setting metadata flags and you know, writing writing rules in a somewhat uh, clever way. Um, something where we need to do more to make it really smooth is you know, updating BIOS. If you, you know, once you know that the BIOS on these machines need to be updated, it would be really cool if you could tell Razor do that, and then on the next scheduled reboot, you, know, you update the BIOS. So you don't need to you know, have a specific reboot schedule just to do the BIOS update. You might have a reboot machines every two weeks policy. So when it reboots, Razor would then make sure that yeah, it first boots the BIOS updater image, and then once that's done, it goes back to booting locally and running whatever is on the machine. OK. Um, yeah. I've got a few pointers here. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. If you have questions. Um, yeah. yeah. If you have questions after the talk, like tomorrow or so, um, yeah, we have a mailing list. Um, IRC channel and so on. I'll just do it again. Touch there. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I mean, <laughs> the thing that, that's, that's kind of awkward is the flipping back and forth between I'm doing a BIOS update and. Yeah, so, so the, the thing is that, that Razor right now, once you've run an installer against it, considers the node installed that keeps it from going through the policy table again. And so we need a way to mark some of these tasks as non-destructive. Non right? that, like some, like actually instru installers are destructive, right? And you would never want to apply them to a node that is already installed. But some of the, those things are non-destructive, like a BIOS update, and you would want to distinguish between those two and allow applying the non-destructive stuff even to nodes that are, are installed. Mm -hmm. brings back uh, flashbacks to a previous life. Uh, <coughs> I don't. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I want to go there, and I don't know how much people would actually want to use TPMs for that, um, or how much they're actually using it for anything. Yeah. So Intel was not that idea. But <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, not not explicit. So the initial the initial implementation had yeah, a state machine, and then when we actually looked at the installers, which in the initial thing were called models that people actually wrote, um, they were all linear processes. There was no yeah, no no real use of the state machine machinery. It just made things very complicated. Um, and so yeah, one of the decisions we took with the rewrite was uh, installs are just linear steps. You do step one, you do step two, you do step three but there's no branching and cycling and, and all that. But some of that will get back with, you know, with the additional data we have about a node and you know, things like what I just said that we just, you know, to distinguish between an installed node and, yeah, or between destructive tasks and non-destructive tasks and allow yeah, non-destructive tasks against installed nodes. So yeah, behind that is probably implicitly a notion of life cycle of the, the machine, but it's not really exposed because I think that that's just too hard for people to, to really make use of. Yes? We don't have, yeah, so can it revoke certificates and, and you know, pull stuff out of the Puppet Master? Um, out of the box, we don't have anything for that, but it, yeah. It's a matter of writing a shell script that actually does that and you know, sticking that into an installer. So it would be a pretty easy exercise to. Yes? Uh, I've heard about Ubuntu Metal as a service. I haven't really looked at, uh, at you know, how they do things. Um, my understanding is that they push much more into a cloud-like mode of operation. Um, I think Ray Razor tries to be very careful to, to strike a balance between you know, being fairly hardware-centric and you know, fairly close to the, the way people use, you know, are used to doing physical management and you know, the, the kind of cloud-like features. Because I think there's, there's a gamut of these uses. I don't think there's you'll make everybody happy by giving them a metal as a service cloud tool. Um, so because of that, I, I would expect that there's quite a few philosophical differences between you know, about this maze and, and Yes, Steve. Generally, I would say whatever you can do with Puppet, do with Puppet, because you know, Puppet is the, the thing that worries about the ongoing maintenance and configuration changes of your boxes, and only do the things you absolutely have to do outside of Puppet in, in Razor. You know, if it's something you need to do to, to even get an operating system on there, you do it with Razor, and everything else you do with Puppet. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, some some platforms allow to do you allow you to do that. Yeah. No, the running system and, and others, yeah, like the tool and the image. Um, yeah, but I mean, if you can do it, perfect. That was another thing we changed from the initial cut is that we moved it to Fedora. Right now we're using Fedora 19. The, the rationale behind that move is that we as Puppet Labs can be in the business of hardware support. I mean, there's companies that do that and they're way bigger than, than Puppet Labs. Um, so the idea here is that eventually we'll move to like an enterprise Linux um, market kernel um, so that you know, if you have a, a support agreement with you know, one of the Vendors, you go and talk to them if, uh, if your micro kernel bars because it doesn't like the network card. But yeah, right now it's the door on IT. Yeah, I mean, 
I actually just noticed that uh, Open Office very helpfully made these these things pretty much illegible. Um, the first one to the server repo is uh, to Puppet Lab slash Razor dash Server, and that's where all the documentation lives to on the wiki for that Git repo. We, I try to keep everything there, and then you know, the other repos are kind of offshoots, um, but all the documentation and most of the information is, is on that. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks very much.